topic that I've chosen this morning, who is Jesus Christ? Because when we answer that question, we resolve the question of the age of the earth. Now, it doesn't, it's a no-brainer when you stop to think about the state of the church in the USA. Is it getting better every year? No. The culture is more and more causing chaos in, our, in this nation and across the West. I'm, I'm not picking on the USA. Uh, it's, it's the same in Australia, it's the same in Canada, the same in England. Here in America, 75% of Americans would call themselves Christians, but when you break it down, some are just cultural Christians or congregational Christians, only about 25% the statistics show are genuine convictional Christians, Bible-believing, uh, convinced Christians that say, and many of them say that they believe the Bible as the literal word of God. But why then isn't the church in the USA impacting? Why isn't the church salt and light in this nation? Why is the church losing ground? And instead of the church influencing the culture, the culture is influencing the church. You know, not a week goes by when we hear of some church that uh, is happy to welcome transgender people as members in, in violation of God's word. Why do surveys repeatedly show you can go to Barna, you can go to uh, Lifeway, surveys continue to indicate that 66% of our youth our church youth, when they go to college, will abandon the church, never to return. We're losing not only the, the, the control of the culture, we're losing our young people, which are the next generation of leaders in the church. The church is literally on the skids. Why? And I believe some of the answer to that is in the things that I'm going to share with you this morning. You know, in Joshua chapter 7, the children of Israel went up. They had a great victory in Jericho. And they went up with, with great gusto. They didn't even take the whole, they selected a, a subset of their army to go up and take Ai. Ai. We've done a great victory in Jericho. Yeah, this is going to be a piece of cake. And what happened? They went up to Ai and they were defeated, utterly defeated. And Joshua, we read, got on his knees before the Lord and, and pleaded with God, why, why? And what did God say to Joshua? Get up, why do you lie thus on your face? Israel has sinned. Achan had taken of the forbidden thing in the city of Jericho. They, Israel has sinned and they have also transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them. Therefore, the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turned their backs before the enemies, because they became doomed to destruction. You see, God holds us to account for compromise for sin. Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, we often read these words. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. What did I skip? What many Christians skip? and turn from their wicked ways. Yes, God says his people have to turn from their wicked ways. He will not hear their prayers or heal their land unless they turn from their wicked ways. So why is the church in America defeated? Why is the church in Australia, in England, defeated? Because there's sin in the church. There's sin in the church. What sin? Unbelief. The church has compromised with a secular culture and the secular worldview. Many Christians believe that God chose evolution and millions of years to create in direct defiance of what God's word says in the beginning God created and instantly things happened. You see, many Christians in the church today will claim they really believe, they believe God's word, but do they really believe God's word? Do they believe it from cover to cover as God breathed, inspired, inerrant, and infallible in every statement and detail? And if you really 
think about that carefully, you'll have to admit that is largely not true of many Christians in many churches. I'm pleased to know that in this church that this is not so. I'm, I'm preaching to the choir this morning. But you need to understand what's happening in the church across this nation if you're to effectively minister to people in this, in this city and in this state and across this great nation. You see, there's controversial issues in the church that divide. They shouldn't divide. The answer is perfectly clear from the scriptures. But you'll get people fighting over issues such were the days in Genesis 1 literal days or long periods of time? Is the earth and the universe therefore young or old? Did God use evolution to progressively bring into existence all life, including man? Or did he create directly and essentially instantaneously? You know, there are those who even doubt that Adam and Eve were literal man and literal woman. They're teaching at Wheaton College, young people, that Adam and Eve weren't real historical people. That Genesis 1 isn't real literal history. It's just a figurative story with theological issues. You've got many theological seminaries that are teaching the, the up and coming pastors. What impact is that going to have on the church if the pastors and the leaders don't believe that God's word is true from cover to cover? They're teaching that the flood was only local, not global. And they're trying to fit millions of years into the Bible. So how do we confront these issues and understand what our response should be personally to begin with? Because you see, it starts with you and with me. We can't change the church, we can't change the culture unless you and I are very clear in our thinking, in our witness, our testimony. So this morning I want to direct your attention to this question. Who is Jesus Christ? Because you see, this is the central question of Christianity. This is the central question of history itself. Whether the atheists of this world recognise it or not. But one day, everyone, the Scriptures say, everyone will have to stand before God on Judgment Day and answer this question. What did you do with my son Jesus Christ? On that hinges your eternal destiny. And yet the Bible makes it crystal clear the answer to that question. It tells us who he was, what he did, and what he said. So I want to direct your thoughts this morning, not to the book of Genesis, but to the book of John. John chapter 1 makes it perfectly clear. John opens his gospel with these words, John 1 Verses one to three. In the beginning was the Word, the Logos, and the Word, the Logos, was with God, and the Word, the Logos, was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. And then we read on in verse 14. And the Word, the Logos, became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. What do we read in verse one? What do we conclude from verse one? That Jesus Christ was and still is the word, the logos, the spoken communication from God, the final and ultimate communication. And verse three, nothing was made without him being involved. Jesus Christ was and still is the creator of the universe and everything that it, it contains. Two passages of scriptures, other scriptures confirm these conclusions. Hebrews 1 verses 1 to 3 we read these words, God, who at various times and in different ways spoke in time past to the fathers through the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his son. The word spoken, the communication from God, who he appointed heir of all things 
Through him, he has made all the worlds and being the brightness of his glory and the expressed image of his person, upholding all things by the word of his power. Yes, <clears throat> Jesus is the brightness of God's glory. Jesus is the one through all things were created. Jesus is the one that is sustaining all things even now. You see, as I said to the Sunday school the class this morning, Genesis opens with in the beginning God, Jesus, the creator. It's his story from beginning to end in the, in the scriptures. We open the scriptures and it's Jesus, the creator. We go to the gospels, it's Jesus, the redeemer. We go to the book of Revelation, it's Jesus, the coming conquering king. The Bible is his story. The genealogies is his family history. He can be our kinsman redeemer because he, the last Adam was biologically related to the first Adam. Colossians chapter one, verses 16 and 17. For by him all things were created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things and in, in him all things consist. You see, Jesus was and still is the word, the logos, the final and ultimate communication from God. Jesus Christ was, still, was and still is the creator of the universe and everything that it contains. He is also the sustainer. He holds all things together. Without him holding the atoms together, they'd fall apart. So it's very easy to think of what the, the creation of the new heaven and earth is going to be. He's going to take his hands off and it's going to explode in fire and he's going to bring his hands back and he's going to make a new heaven and a new earth. You see, the scriptures are perfectly clear that Jesus was also fully human. When he came to this earth, the word, the logos, became flesh and dwelt among us. God had sent the prophets, they killed them. And in the final Revelation, the final act was God sent his own son, the creator of the universe, and he clothed himself in human flesh. Yes, he was totally human. He was, remained totally God. Yet in his human flesh, he experienced weariness, pain and testing, but without sin. Unlike us, he never failed the test. He never sinned. And as I said, he never ceased to be the creator during his earthly ministry. He said in John 10, 30, I and my father are one. Even when as a 12 year old boy, when he was in the temple and his parents said, why did you tarry? Why did you give us angst? He said, I must be about my father's business. So how do I know apart from scripture, those scripture verses that Jesus was the creator and is the creator. You know, we fail to realise that Jesus demonstrated his power as the creator by the miracles that he did. That he was still the creator. He was still fully God during his earthly ministry. Let's think about some of those miracles. First of all, he demonstrated his power over nature. You know, they got on a boat on the Sea of Galilee, these hardened fishermen, Peter, Andrew, James and John, and the other disciples, and they set sail across the Sea of Galilee. And what happened? A fierce storm arose, and Jesus was asleep in the back of the boat. Yes, he experienced weariness. He fell asleep. And these hardened fishermen were afraid for their lives. And they shook the master. Don't you care that we perish? And what do we read? He arose and rebuked the winds and the sea. And immediately there was a great calm. Did you catch that? Didn't take millions of years. With a word, Jesus spoke and instantly there was a great calm. He was the creator. Therefore, the winds and the waves had to obey him instantly. 
And if, it, if he did that in front of witnesses there in the Sea of Galilee, what's the problem in, John, in Genesis chapter one when we read God said, let there be light and instantly there was light? No difference. He stilled a storm instantly. Therefore, he made light instantly. What was the disciples' response when they saw this happen? How hum? No, they fell on their faces and worshipped him. What manner of man is this that even the wind and the waves obey him? They recognise they're in the presence of the very creator of the universe. He demonstrated his power over nature when he walked on water during a storm. He defied gravity. Remember, he set the disciples off on the boat while he went and prayed and then the storm came up and in the fourth watch of the night, he came walking to them across the, the stormy seas and they thought there was a ghost and they were afraid. But what happened, as soon as he entered the boat, it was as still as a mill pond, instantly. Just like previously, there was a great calm, a great calm. It went from a raging storm to instant mill pond. Only the creator of the universe has that power. And Jesus demonstrated his power as the creator in his human flesh when he walked this earth. And when he created, he created instantly. That's right. We read about this in John chapter two, his first miracle. He turned water into wine instantly. Remember, he was invited to the marriage feast and they ran out of wine And what happened? Jesus told the servants to fill the water pots and to draw out and take to the master. And when the master tasted that water, it actually was wine. It had been instantly turned into wine. How do I know that that was a miracle of creation? Any chemist in the room knows that water is H2O and wine is a complex organic molecule. Only the creator of the elements that make up our universe could turn water into wine instantly. And he did it in front of eyewitnesses. It's recorded for us. So why should we doubt what he did in Genesis chapter one? He did it instantly, turning water into wine. He created it instantly back there in Genesis chapter one. He demonstrated his power to instantly create when he fed 5,000 men plus women and children in Matthew 14, and 4,000 men plus women and children in Matthew 15. He took bread, loaves, and fish. He broke. And and we read afterwards that everyone was fed from five loaves and two fishes. They ate and were filled, and there were 12 baskets full remaining of the fragments. What a miracle. A miracle of creation. The disciples saw that. He prayed, he broke it, broke it, broke it, broke it, created more, 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 more. Why should we doubt the record in Genesis chapter one when the creator of the universe did these miracles instantly in front of us? He demonstrated his power over life when he healed a man born blind, recorded in John chapter nine. Notice that this was a man who was born blind. He'd never seen a tree, a door, a house, a person, a dog. He'd heard these things, but he'd never seen them. He was born blind. And we read that Jesus anointed the eyes of the blind man with clay. He washed, he went and washed and came back seeing. Only the creator of eyes could open this blind man's eyes. But there's a double miracle here, by the way, because we told this man was born blind. Remember, he hadn't seen what a dog was or a house or a a camel or a donkey. No, when this man had his eyes open to see, he recognised what he was seeing, even though he hadn't seen it before. In other words, Jesus at the same time programmed his brain. You and I learn as children as we grow up what the names of different things are. This man had it all instant. The creator of brains programmed the brain of this man who had been born blind at the same time as he healed his eyes. 
Only the creator of the universe could do that. And he had power over life when he raised Jairus' daughter from the dead. Oh, by the time Jesus got there to Jairus' home, his daughter had, just, had died. But what did Jesus do? He went in and took her by the hand and the girl came back to life. The ultimate example of his power over life was his friend Lazarus, Mary and, Martha, Mary and Martha's brother, Lazarus in Bethany. He died. And you know, Jesus, Jesus uh, held back from going. He deliberately delayed going to Bethany to see Mary and Martha. So by the time he got there, they said to him, Lord, by this time there is a stench for he's been dead four days. But what did Jesus do? He went to the grave, he wept. He wept, why did he weep? Because he'd see, he, he, he could see the result of the curse, death. He was sorrowful for death, the death of his friend Lazarus. But he removed the stone and what did he do? Got, uh, Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth. And instantly, the one who had died, whose body was rotting in the grave, came forward walking, bound hand and foot in the grave clothes. Only the creator of life could conquer death like that. And he demonstrated by this miracle that he was the creator. He demonstrated his power over demons when he healed a demon-possessed man. He commanded this unclean spirit, the demon, to come out of the man. And they came out. They had to obey him because he had the authority. He had the authority over everything in this universe because he's the creator who made everything. Isn't that what we read? Nothing invisible or visible was made that wasn't made by Jesus Christ. He has the absolute authority over everything. That's why we can trust him for tomorrow because he has control over everything. You know, an implication for this, friends, is that as the creator, Jesus also always spoke the truth. He had to, by definition. The creator couldn't tell a lie. God is not a man that he should lie. And we reminded that he is the truth. He always spoke the truth. Even when he spoke about Genesis chapters 1 through 11. Remind ourselves in John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Friends, if he isn't the truth, if he told us a lie, he's not the way and he's not the life. End of story. Everything hinges on him always ever telling us the truth. What did Jesus say in John chapter three? If I've told you earthly things and you do not believe, how you will believe if I tell you heavenly things? We're gonna look at some of the earthly things that Jesus told us. Four verses later, Jesus says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. The heavenly things. And Jesus said prior to that, saying that if you don't believe the earthly things, I tell you, how are you gonna believe the heavenly things? He also said in John chapter five, for if ye believe, he was speaking to the Jewish leaders. Or it's sarcastic, by the way, we miss some of the sarcasm in Jesus' statement. Here he's talking to the Jewish leaders who knew the scriptures back the front. He said, but for if you believe Moses, you would have believed me for he wrote of me. But if you believe not his writings, how will you believe my words? What books of the Bible did Moses write? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Moses wrote Genesis 1 to 11 under the direction of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, if you don't believe what Moses wrote, you're not gonna believe my words. So as I said before, Jesus always spoke the truth. If he didn't always speak the truth and nothing but the total, total truth, he cannot be the way or the life. What do we read? Mark 13, verse 19, Jesus said, the beginning of the, spoke of the beginning of the creation which God created. So Jesus taught and totally believed 
that God created the creation from the beginning. So if Jesus believed and said and taught that, then you and I should totally believe exactly that. No compromise. And Jesus also said in Matthew 19 and Mark 10, from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. Notice that? From the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. Not after billions of years of cosmic, geologic and biological evolution. Because you see, that's what the secular world teaches. That's what the Christian evolutionist teaches. That God, over millions of years of cosmic, biological and geological evolution, eventually, eventually, man came into existence. Billions of years after the beginning. No, Jesus cuts to the chase. He says, from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. Do you believe that? Jesus said it. Jesus taught it. If you, if you don't believe it, you're calling him a liar. Sadly, sadly, those Christians who compromise on the millions of years are calling Jesus Christ a liar and I say that with fear and trepidation because friends I know that I too will have to stand before the Lord and there'll be a stricter judgment for those who teach you know friends we've lost in the modern church the fear of the Lord where we gather here to worship the creator of the universe we should fear him Respect him, honour him. Jesus spoke the truth when he quoted Genesis 2 verse 24 as literal historical, the literal historical basis for marriage. This is unpopular. It would get me marked down for hate speech. But Matthew 19 and Mark 10, Jesus said, Therefore, shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. He was talking of that as the literal basis for marriage. God is the author of marriage. God has set the rules for marriage. One man for one woman for life. They become one flesh. Notice that when he was quoting in Genesis chapter 2, verse 24, he was also quoting Genesis 1, 20, 27. God made man and woman, and a man will leave his, his, his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and they will be one flesh. He was quoting these two chapters at the same time. They're not com contradictory accounts of creation. They're complementary. The focus in Genesis 1 is on the big picture. The focus of Genesis 2 is narrowing down onto the history of man. Genesis 1 is a chronological account. Genesis 2 is a relational account of, of the created order. There's no contradiction. Jesus saw no contradiction. He quoted both chapters at the same time to make his point about the biblical basis for marriage. Jesus spoke the truth when he referred to Adam's son Abel as a real historical person. He spoke of the blood of righteous Abel. So if Jesus believed that Abel was a real historical person, then so should you and I. And Jesus spoke of the days of Noah as a literal historical period in which a real man Noah lived. And if Jesus taught that, you and I should also believe that. And Jesus at the same time spoke of Noah entering the ark and the flood came and took them all away, not some, all. Can't have been a local flood because a local flood wouldn't take all away. See how every word in Scripture counts? And Jesus spoke of this as a literal historical period in which there was an ark and a life-destroying global flood. And by the way, notice the context here in Matthew 24. Because the context was that the disciples had asked Jesus about signs of his second coming. And Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the coming day of the Son of Man. 
So Jesus was comparing his second coming with the flood. Do Christians doubt that Jesus' second coming will be global? I hope you don't. If the second coming is global, was glo- is going to be global, the flood had to be global because the contrast, the comparison doesn't stand up. The flood came and took them all away. By the way, one of Jesus' lit- lit- listeners was the apostle Peter in 2 Peter chapter 3. Peter said that last day scoffers will deliberately deny the evidence that God created, that he judged the world in a flood and they'll scoff that Jesus Christ is coming again. The flood, the creation is global, the second coming is global, the flood had to be global. You have to be consistent. And Jesus spoke the truth when he said, the flood came and took them all away. We have to recognise, friends, this morning, that as the all-knowing and all-powerful eternal creator, Jesus Christ's power and word are superior, outrank, finite, fallible man's finite, fallible observations and reasoning. It is sheer arrogance for finite, fallible people, creatures, to tell their creator that the creator didn't tell us all correctly in his word, the Bible, and by his word, the Logos. Because you can see those who compromise on Genesis chapter 1 to 11 are saying that God, God didn't tell us the truth. You know, the secular world picks up on that because if Christians don't believe Genesis chapter 1, why should the secular world believe John 3.16? If, if the Christians say that the Genesis chapter 1 to 11 can't be trusted, the secularist says, well, okay, I can't trust John 3.16. You see, it's all or nothing. You can't pick and choose which parts of God's word are truth and what are not. It's all truth from cover to cover. And to say anything different is shaking the fist at God and arrogantly saying that the creator of the universe didn't tell us the truth. That we, we with all our knowledge, which is a drop in the bucket compared to God's knowledge, know better than what God does. How arrogant it is for finite, fallible man to shake his fist at the creator of the universe. Let's backtrack for a minute because I want to unpack for you some other interesting observations from that first miracle of Jesus in John chapter 2. A very important detail that you need to understand and informs the way we look at the, the, the Genesis creation account. You'll recall that Jesus went with his mother and disciples to the marriage feast in Cana. As I said before, they ran out of wine. So Mary asked Jesus to do something about it. He was a bit reluctant, but he went ahead and did what his mother asked. And what did he do? We read that he instantaneously created the wine from the water by speaking it into existence. Exactly as in Genesis chapter 1. He spoke and it came into existence. Fill the water pots with water. What do we read in Genesis chapter one? Then God said, let the earth bring forth the grass. Then God said, let the earth bring forth the living creature according to its kind. And it was so. It happened exactly as God said. It happened as God said. And then what happened? Jesus told the servants who had filled the water pots, to draw out some of the wine that they had seen created. The servants were a witness to this miracle. They filled the water pots. They took out the wine and they took it to the master of the feast. Now the master of the feast hadn't seen what had happened. He was ignorant. And so he looked at this wine and he tasted it. And what did he say? Wow, this is great wine. Why have you kept the best wine until now? You see, friends, he was assuming, because he hadn't seen the miracle, he was assuming that this wine had come from grapes grown on vines that had been harvested, crushed and fermented, all requiring years. He'd assumed an apparent history when there had been no history. 
That's the important point to make. You know, Christians, some Christians look and say, well, the rocks look old. No, we put the age on the rocks. The rocks don't look old, they're just rocks. And when God created, it instantly happened. There wasn't any prior history. There was no appearance of age. Oh, but the master of thieves thought so because he hadn't seen the miracle. Jesus had done that miracle to fulfill an immediate need. They needed wine. But the master of thieves thought it had an apparent history and appearance of age. What do we read in Genesis chapter one? God said, let the earth bring forth the fruit tree that yields fruit, and it was so. And the Lord brought forth the tree that yields fruit. Why? Why did God, did he make, put in the ground seedlings that had to grow and mature to produce fruit? No. He created instantly fruit trees already bearing fruit. Why? Because he knew that three days later, Adam and Eve would need food. They couldn't sit around waiting a long time for everything to grow so they had food to eat. And that's what Jesus did. He created this wine instantly to fulfill a need that was there in front of him. And people say to me, but, but God has deceived us. You know, the rocks look old, so God must have deceived us. No, Jesus didn't deceive anyone when he did this miracle. He did it in front of eyewitnesses. And what more, he even sent the servants to the master of the feast to give testimony. But the master of the feast, he didn't know what happened. But you see, the the master of the feast made the big mistake that all the world's scientists make. The master of the feast looked at the evidence without availing himself of the eyewitness report. Jesus had sent the servants to him. Instead of talking to the servants, he talked to the bridegroom. Why why have you left the best wine to last? He should have turned to the servants and said, where did this wine come from? And they would have told him, that man over there told us to fill these water pots and he turned that water into wine instantly. They ignored the eyewitness testimony. And that's the problem with the secular scientific community. They ignore the eyewitness testimony. Many Christians who work in science have ignored the creator's testimony of what happened. That's why they make the mistake. That's why they think there's an appearance of age. No, there's no non-existent history or appearance of age because Jesus created that wine instantly in front of eyewitnesses. Just like we're told in Genesis chapter one, God said, let there be light and instantly there was light. It didn't take millions of years. It happened as Jesus said it did, and it was so. Similarly, Jesus didn't deceive when he fed the 5,000 men plus women and children and the 4,000 men and plus women and children by breaking in fish, bread and fish to instantly create. He did it in front of the, the eyewitness testimony from the disciples. That's why we have the written record. John said, these things are written that ye might believe. The eyewitness testimony that the creator himself came and walked among us. And the bread and the fish looked and tasted exactly the same as the original. There hadn't been wheat that had been harvested and crushed. There hadn't been fishlings that had to grow. No, the creator of, of, of wheat and fish could make bread and full grown fish just like he made fruit trees that were already growing fruit to meet the need. So you see, the master of the feast in John chapter two deceived himself by wrongly interpreting the evidence. He used his human reasoning alone rather than availing himself of the report of the eyewitnesses that Jesus sent to him. Friends, all the paleontologists, all the geologists that talk about evolution and millions of years, They are using their human reasoning alone. They are ignoring the eyewitness, the testimony of the creator himself. 
who didn't deceive us because he's told us exactly what happened. The eyewitness account is here. So, how old does the earth and the the universe look? Does it take light billions of years to reach the earth from the farthest galaxies? These are questions that people raise as objections. Doesn't radioactive dating of rock, earth's rocks prove that they are millions and billions of years old? Don't rocks take a long time to form? Absolutely no. None of those things are correct. The perception of an apparent history and an appearance of age are interpretations that we impose on the earth and the universe. God didn't say that there was a prior history. God didn't say there's an appearance of age. We impose that on the evidence. We look at a rock. We put a date on a rock. We put a date on a fossil. You see, young people, parents, we need to recognise that we have been indoctrinated by the unbiblical belief around us that the past has always operated in the same way the earth and universe operate today. No, Genesis 1 through 11 tells us two are times, two times when geological processes didn't operate at today's rate. In Genesis chapter 1 during the creation week when God did things instantly and during the flood. And it's unbiblical. It's unbiblical to suggest that everything has gone on for millions of years slowly and gradually and the rocks take a long time to form. And the radioactive clocks give millions of years ages for the, for the earth. No, those dates are all based on unbiblical assumptions. So the earth and the universe instead are young. We know that from the genealogies. His family history is, coincides with the history of the universe. In the beginning, God created Adam and Eve, who begat Seth, who begat, who begat, who begat. And in the fullness of time, Jesus Christ came. The second and last Adam related biologically to the first. Has God deceived us? Absolutely not. How could he have created in six literal days? He stilled storms instantly. I don't have any doubt of what it says in Genesis chapter 1 because we have eyewitness testimony of what he did in John when he stilled the storm. How would Adam have seen all the stars? Well, he must have because God created the stars for signs and for seasons. If he couldn't see the stars, how would he know the signs and the seasons? You know, in Job chapter 38, by the way, Job never found out why he suffered. We know because we're told. And Job went through a lot of suffering and he questioned God. And there was this great test of Job and he wanted to meet with God to get an answer and then we read in Job 38 then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge now prepare yourself like a man I will question you and you shall answer me where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth tell me if you have understanding who determines its measurements surely you know To what were its foundations fastened? Or who laid its cornerstone? And verse after verse after verse, God says, do you know this, Job? Do you know this, Job? Do you know this? Do you know this? What was the end result in Job 41? Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do everything, that no purpose of yours can be withheld from you. You asked, who is this who hides counsel with knowledge, without knowledge? Therefore, I utterly uttered what I didn't understand, things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. I have heard you by the hearing of the ear, and now my, my eye sees you. Therefore, I abhor myself, and I repent in dust and ashes. You see, Job's perspective was changed. His suffering became irrelevant when he met the creator of the universe and understood that he alone is the one that knows everything and we know nothing by comparison. Isaiah, the prophet says, shall the clay say to him who forms it, what are you making? Or shall the handiwork say who has, say he has no hands? Thus saith the Lord, the Holy One of Israel and his maker, I have made the earth and created man on it. 
It was I, my hands that stretched out the heavens and all the hosts that I have commanded. You see, friends, can anyone scientifically explain how Jesus, the creator, stilled the storm or walked on water? Can anyone scientifically explain how Jesus turned the water into wine or how he made more bread and fish as the creator? So why should we try to explain how God created the heavens and earth in Genesis chapter one? They were similar miracles of creation. Or why should we try to question what God tells us he did? You know, some people tell us, say to us, well, God could have taken millions of years. It's not a question of what God could have done. It's a question of what he tells us he did. And he tells us very clearly, in six days. God has not deceived us because he told us what he did, when he did it, and how he did it. He spoke and it came into existence. He spoke and it came into instance, uh, instantly into existence. It didn't take millions of years just like it didn't take millions of years to still the storm. Does man know all things like God does? Is man infinite like God is? No, no. As I said before, how arrogant of finite, fallible men to think he can arrive at the truth using his own reasoning. So do we know how the light travels in all regions of space and how fast? No. No. We make untestable assumptions when we put millions of years and billions of years on light travel. Do we know whether radioactive decay has always occurred at the same rate as today? No. We weren't there in the past to measure radioactive decay in the past. The evidence shows that it went a lot faster, in fact, during the flood, like other geological processes were catastrophic. And why couldn't God have already created some of the daughter products of radioactive decay when he created the rocks to begin with. And why does the earth supposedly look old? As I said before, it's only because of the assumptions that people use to interpret what we see and measure. It is assumed that only present observable geological processes and their rates is all that is required to explain how the earth and its rock layers formed. You see, friends, this is a direct denial of what God tells us in his word, his eyewitness account about the creation of the global flood. Yet the tragedy is that so many Christians and Christian leaders and Christian academics bow the knee at the altar of human reasoning, academic pride, peer pressure, and in fact, they allow unbelievers, unbelievers to tell God and to tell us that God didn't create the earth or judge it by the global flood. And that's the compromise that has infected the church. That's the reason why the church is being defeated in our culture. The sin of unbelief. But let me get to the climax here this morning. Jesus' power and word outrank all finite man's fallible reasoning. Jesus instantly created, just as he said he did, and he demonstrated by his eyewitness miracles. Time is irrelevant to God. As God dwells in eternity, he's outside time. Time was made for man and the created order. You know, people look at uh, 2 Peter chapter 3 and where it says a thousand years is a day and a day is like a thousand years. They say, see, the days were thousands of years long. No, 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 no. It's a cross-reference to Psalm 90, verse 4. Because you see, time is irrelevant to God. I like to think of it as the news reporter on the helicopter watching the uh, parade from the helicopter. He can see the beginning and the end. He's outside the parade. Those in the parade can't see the beginning, in the middle of the parade can't see the beginning. They can't see the end. God is outside of time. He dwells in eternity. What man would take a long time to do, God can do just like that because time is irrelevant. My thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are my ways, nor uh, nor are my ways, your, uh, your ways, my ways. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Finally, and most importantly, not only is Jesus Christ our creator, He's also 
our Saviour. We sung of that this morning. But I want to remind you as we draw to a close this morning that the power of the gospel depends on the power of Jesus as the creator. Let me repeat that. The power of the gospel depends on the power of Jesus, the creator. You know, I want you to think about it this morning. I get emotional when I think about this. So I get choked up, you'll understand. God demonstrated his love for us by sending his only son, the creator of the universe himself. Think about that. None other than the creator of the universe came to earth to die for you and for me. When we talk about God being love, that's the ultimate definition of love. God loved you, he loved me, he loved every one of us so much that he sent his son, the creator, Jesus Christ, to die for you, for me. You're of infinite worth to God. He sent the infinite creator to die for you. Doesn't that blow your minds? How can we comprehend that? The, the depth of God's love, the manner of God in loving us like that. The scriptures say that one man could die for one man, but think about it. Only the infinite creator could die for all people in all places throughout all times. Only the creator could pay the penalty for everyone's sin throughout all history. If he isn't the creator, he couldn't die for everyone. If he wasn't the creator and isn't the creator, he couldn't bear all those sins on the cross. You see, it's because he's the creator that we know that all our sins were nailed to that cross. That's what I mean, that the gospel, the power of the gospel depends on Jesus Christ as the creator. The ultimate example of love, the ultimate sacrifice was that the creator himself, the one that called the worlds into existence in Genesis chapter one, was the one for God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. He went all the way to the cross. But we know the story, the history doesn't end there because he's the creator. And he demonstrated with his miracles that he had power over life. He had power over death. So because he was the creator, he had power he could lay down his life voluntarily. He chose to die for you and for me. He could have avoided it if he chose to, but he didn't. And because he had the power to lay down his life, he had the power to take up his life again. And he rose from the dead. And because he lives, it's our guarantee that we will live eternally with him also. Isn't that a wonderful, glorious message? It depends on the, Jesus being the creator himself. And that guarantees that our eternal home is with him forever. Isn't that an incredible thought? You and I are gonna live for eternity with the creator of the universe. Am I saying that you have to believe that Jesus created all things in order to be saved? Am I suggesting that you have to believe Genesis 1 to 11 as literal history to be saved? Absolutely not. Don't misunderstand me, friends, this morning. I'm not saying that at all. It's very clear in Scripture there, nor is there salvation in any other, for there's no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved but Jesus. Romans 10 verse 9, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Does it say there, if you will confess with your mouth that Genesis 1 to 11 is literal history? No, it doesn't say that. It doesn't say that. Believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. But who is Jesus Christ? How can he save us? It's because as the creator, he could go to the cross and die for all men in all places throughout all time. And he had the power to rise from the dead so he can offer us eternal life. You see, 
He derives the power to save us because he is the creator. So does it really matter what you think or believe about the days of creation, the flood, the age of the earth? Absolutely. Why? Because Genesis 1 through 11 lays the foundation for the gospel. It introduces us to Jesus, the creator. It introduces us to his family lineage. It introduces to a need of a saviour. Because of Adam's failure in the Garden of Eden is why we need a saviour. If Adam wasn't a real literal person and there wasn't a literal fall, then why do we need a saviour? You see, evolution teaches, man's word says that death and suffering over millions of years brought man into existence. But let's be clear, friends. God's word says that he created man in a perfect world and it was our rebellion that brought death and suffering into the world. Don't blame God for death and suffering, for sickness, disease. It's man's fault. It's man's fault. And any Christian who has compromised and says that evolution over millions of years brought man into existence, they have no answer as to why there's death and suffering in the world. Because death and suffering has always been here. It's a different gospel. It's no gospel. Evolution and millions of years cannot save us. Only Jesus Christ, the creator, can save us. Therefore, just as one man sin entered the world, through one man sin entered the world and death through sin and thus death spread to all men because all have sinned. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. You see, friends, how can people understand the good news unless they first of all understand the bad news? You know, I cringe when I hear people say, oh, trust in Jesus, trust in Jesus. The unbeliever has no idea who Jesus is. You first of all got to tell him why he needs Jesus. And why he needs Jesus is because there was a literal Adam and Eve in a garden of Eden who ate of a literal fruit and rebelled against God and God cursed and brought death and suffering in the world and promised there would be a redeemer who would come, the creator himself, Jesus Christ. You see, friends, the gospel is all about what happened back in Genesis. And therefore, it lays the foundation for the good news that people need to hear about. So the power of the gospel depends on the power of Jesus, the creator. So we close, as we close, I want you to think about it. Do Christians and their churches really believe Jesus is the creator? I emphasize really. I'm sure it's true in this church, from what I've heard, that you do really believe Jesus is the creator. But how many Christians really do that? Really do? Do they really believe? Or do they doubt Genesis 1 to 11? Because you see, if we really do believe Jesus is both the creator and our savior, then it changes our lives. It changes how we live. You see, we live in the presence of our almighty creator and saviour. He knows and sees our every thought, our every action. Nothing is hidden from him. When we believe that Jesus is the creator, it changes how we live. It changes how we pray. Because as the creator, he can choose to do whatever he wants to do. And he might actually answer our prayer. We could actually trust him to answer in the best way possible for us. So when we believe that he is the creator, we can trust him and we should obey him. So as we begin, why is the church in the USA and the West not impacting the culture and losing ground? Unbelief. We've compromised with the secular culture and the worldview and the, cult, the secular worldview. 
As Paul said to Timothy, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. You see, the church by and large does not really believe God's word, the Bible is God's word from cover to cover. God breathed, inspired, inerrant, infallible in every statement and detail. Instead, many Christians put man's word based on finite, fallible, sinful, rebellious human reasoning above and in judgment of God's word. We as individuals and the church need to repent. I challenge each one of us this morning. Change starts with each one of us. Don't worry about the person next to you. It starts with you. As I said yesterday, we have no reason to be without hope. Either way we win. God could come by his Holy Spirit and bring revival and the church could come to life again and be on fire for him and change the culture. Or Jesus could come again and take us to be with him for eternity. It's a win-win situation. We don't have to be miserable without hope. We worship and adore a risen saviour, the creator of the universe, who, who upholds all things by the word of his power. You see, it all starts with us individually repenting of our unbelief. If everyone in the church repented of our unbelief and truly believed in the power of Jesus Christ in the gospel, the church would be on fire. We need to believe thy word is true from the beginning. The entirety of your word is truth. Friends, I close with this verse. 1 Peter 4, verse 17. For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. That's right. If God judges the United States, if God judges Australia, England, it will start at the house of God because we're not being salt and light. And if it begins with us first, what will the end be of those who do not believe the, the gospel of God? So friends, Jesus Christ is the key to understanding creation, the age of the earth, and the gospel. Do you believe? Let's pray. Father, we, in your presence this morning, we stop in the silence of this moment to worship you. We have an inadequate lips, inadequate hearts to sing and speak the praises that are worthy to your name. You are the glorious almighty one, the creator of the universe. And yet you humbled yourself, sending your son, our creator, to die on the cross for us, to show us your love. Oh, Father, we pray that the things we've considered this morning will burn in our hearts and will change our lives. That we will go out determined to trust every word in your word from cover to cover. That it will change our lives. Help us to trust you and to obey you. To be light and salt in the communities and the places that you've placed us so that our testimony, our witness, will turn people by your Holy Spirit's power to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, our wonderful creator, our glorious saviour, and our almighty soon coming king, in whose name we pray these things. Amen.